Church at Heartland. Good to see you this morning. Learn to play well. Good morning. Welcome to Calvary Chapel. I'm sorry to interrupt y'all. <laughs> but let's worship the Lord. I will sing 
thank you so much for the opportunity to sing hallelujah. Lord, it's beautiful to you, no matter what our voices are, no matter uh, what our uh, insecurities are. Lord, we just give our voices to you, give our life to you, give our day to you. Lord, just pray that you use us and guide us in all things. And thank Jerry today as he delivers your message. Just speak to us through your word. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You guys may greet one another. Good morning. Good morning. God is good, isn't he? Amen. Seeing everybody fellowshipping and loving on each other. That's the best part of service to me. In the way of announcements for this week... Uh, as always, refreshments and fresh eggs over in the cafe before and after church. Ladies' Bible studies, again, kick off this week on the, their every first and third Tuesday, but they'll be this week on Tuesday in the morning at 9.30 a.m. in the cafe with my wife, Kathy, and in the evening uh, with Donna at 6.30 p.m. on the same day, also in the cafe. Men of the Word. Every Tuesday morning at 6.30 a.m. bright and early at Chick-fil-A on Watson Boulevard with Greg Cannington. And Men of the Word p.m. every second and fourth Tuesday with Pastor Aaron, uh, also in the cafe at 7 p.m. A word on Wednesdays with Pastor Phil uh, at 6.30 p.m. and they're out of town. Pastor Aaron filled in last week with a study on Psalm 1. If you have a chance, go back and listen to that on YouTube or on Facebook. <clears throat> this week, I'll be substituting and we'll pick up his study in Numbers chapter 15. Misfits every Friday night at 6 p.m. in the cafe also with Pastor Kirk. And here they just went on a little trip. Woo! <laughs> we have any teenagers in here that went on that trip? Do you have a good time? <laughs> <laughs> you expect me to hear that rattle all the way up here? <laughs> supposed to jump and shout. Uh, I bet they are. Uh, I want to mention if you want your giving records from last year, there's a little card like this on the Agape Box counter out there. If you just fill that out and drop it in the Agape Box, we'll be sure and get your records from last year to you. Uh, in the way of uh, upcoming events, Many of you have heard the movie Jesus Revolution is coming out on February 24th. And it, we discussed this. I went to a pastor's retreat and we discussed this in detail. But it's, it's basically a movie about the life of Greg Laurie. But it talks about Calvary Chapel and Chuck Smith and how it all started. Uh, and much of it was filmed in Alabama, if you believe that. <laughs> They probably had to take down a lot of the rebel flags and the different things. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'd also like to point out a couple of uh, local ministries. If, say you're someone who's not good at talking and you want to just get in and help somebody, uh, Grace House is a ministry that, that we as a church have supported. It's right there in Port Valley. They give food to those who are in need. And there are many people during this day and time that are in need. Uh, but they... They do volunteer work on Tuesdays and Thursdays. So if you're a teenager, an adult, young adult, uh, that's a great place to, to jump in and help out. They need help loading and unloading the groceries. Also, Caring Solutions in Macon, which is a crisis pregnancy center where they encourage young women who find themselves pregnant. Uh, they give them advice. They show them the way of the Lord. They encourage them. They help them out. Trying to save the life of that unborn child. I think that's about all the way we have in the way of announcements. So if you remember our study as we started in the book of Mark, we noted that Mark's gospel, it was at a fast pace. That it was condensed and jam-packed to tell the story of Jesus who is a humble servant. And a man of action. The word immediately appears often in the gospel of Mark. And Mark, he tells of these uh, miracles that take place. As Jesus is actively living out his ministry before his disciples and before the people of the day. 
And the first two-thirds of the book, it moves quickly and it covers about three years plus of Jesus' life. But the last third of the book covers one week, and that's the part we're in now, through his death, burial, and resurrection. And we have seen Jesus in action the last couple of chapters. You know, as he came into Jerusalem, riding lowly on the donkey, and then he went in and cleansed the temple, and then faced a group of top religious leaders from these various groups, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, the Herodians, basically the whole council at different times of this Jewish nation. And he did so humbly and victoriously. As he fought them not with anger, but with truth. But it kindled their anger against him, didn't it? And that anger grew out of jealousy and pride. Uh, Which brings us to this chapter 13 we're going to look at today, which is a condensed, abbreviated version of the Olivet Discord. Remember back in Matthew's account, it was two chapters long as there were more parables and more things that Jesus was talking about. But here today, we're going to read through chapter 13 as we study. So if you have a Bible, go ahead and stand. If you need a Bible, raise your hand. And we'll get one put in your hand. And we'll read together the whole chapter. Chapter 13, beginning in verse 1. It says, Then as he went out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Teacher, what manner of stones and what buildings are here? And Jesus answered and said to him, Do you see these great buildings? Not one stone shall be left upon another that shall not be thrown down. Now as he sat on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign when all these things will be fulfilled? And Jesus answering them began to say, Take heed that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, saying, I am he, and will deceive many. And when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be troubled. For such things must happen, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines and troubles. These are the beginnings of sorrows. But watch out for yourselves, for they will deliver you up to councils, and you will be beaten in the synagogues, and you will be brought before rulers and kings for my sake, for a testimony to them. And the gospel must first be preached to all the nations. But when they arrest you and deliver you up, do not worry beforehand or premeditate what you will speak. But whatever is given to you in that hour, speak that. For it is not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. Now brother will betray brother to death, and a father his child. And children will rise up against parents and cause them to be put to death. And you will be hated by all men for my name's sake. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. But when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel, the prophet, standing where it ought not, let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains, and let him who is on the housetop not go down into the house, nor enter and take anything out of his house. And let him who is in the field not go back to get his garment. But woe to those who are pregnant and those who are with nursing babies in those days. And pray that your flight may not be in winter. For in those days there will be tribulation, such as has not been from the beginning of creation which God created until this time, nor ever shall be. And unless the Lord had shortened those days, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect saved, whom he chose, he shortened the days. Then if anyone says to you, look here is the Christ, or look, He is there. Do not believe it, for false Christs and false prophets will rise and show signs and wonders to deceive many, if possible, even the elect. Take heed. See, I have told you all things beforehand. 
But in those days after the tribulation, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars of heaven will fall and the powers in heaven shall, will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. And then he will send his angels and gather together his elect from the four winds from the farthest part of the earth to the farthest part of heaven. Now learn this parable from the fig tree. When its branch has already become tender and put forth its leaves, you know summer is near. So you also, when you see these things happening, know that it is near at the very doors. Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. But of that day and hour, no one knows, neither the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. Take heed, watch and pray, for you do not know when the time is. It is like a man going into a far country who left his house and gave authority to his servants and to each his work and commanded the doorkeeper to watch. Watch, therefore, for you do not know when the master of the house is coming. In the evening, at midnight, at the crowing of the rooster, or in the morning, lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping. And what I say to you, I say to all, watch. Let's pray. Father God, we just thank you and we praise you, God, that you give us what you would have us to know, what you would have us to see. And we just pray that by your spirit, Lord, you would reveal to us your heart's desire for us as we watch for your coming, Lord, as we look for your returning, as we yearn for your appearing, God, help us to be faithful about the business you've called us to, Lord, that you don't come back to find us sleeping, but you find us busy doing what you have called each of us to do. Lord, we give you all praise, Lord, and if there's someone here that's hurting today, I pray that today they would be encouraged by your word. But we just praise you in all things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. May you be seated. <laughs> so there's a word, take heed. It's blepo in the Greek. It means to watch out, to see to it. It means to discern mentally, to observe, to discover, to understand. And Mark warns us several times. In Mark 13, 5, he tells us to take heed. 13.23, but take heed. 13.33, take heed, watch and pray. He's trying to tell us something. And then he concludes the passage with verse 37, I say to you, I say to all, watch. So as we go through this study, focus on what Jesus is telling us to pay attention to, what we're to take heed of. Because as we go through this chapter, there are many people who have taught many, many various viewpoints and perspectives on this very chapter. But know this, that even though we may disagree on what it is exactly saying, we will try to keep it on the rails, but at the same time, if we disagree, it doesn't take away our salvation, all right? We can disagree and understand that we see this differently. So in the parallel passage in Mark, uh, I mean, Matthew 24 and 25, which we have already gone through, and then Luke chapter 21, which we have not yet studied, there's much greater detail than this passage in Mark. But know that this passage in Mark is the longest passage of Jesus speaking in this entire gospel. And it begins in verse 1. Then as we went out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Teacher, see what manner of stones and buildings are here? They were looking at the temple which isn't up there. But they were departing the temple, and they were bringing to a close Jesus' ministry on earth. You know, because from this point on, he's pretty much going to face judgment. And they're actually leaving the temple grounds, and the temple grounds were a 35-acre complex. It's a pretty big area that's surrounded by a huge stone wall. And as they're walking out, they're noticing these beautiful buildings. 
they were noticing the temple and the disciples, they point out the beauty and the majesty of that temple. Still undergoing restoration, remember Herod had begun to restore the temple and it would continue on through 63 AD. So the restoration was still in process while he was teaching. And these stones that they're admiring, the stones they're pointing out to Jesus, there it is. So you see that big area is the temple grounds, and then the temple is right in the center. But it's a huge facility, and thousands of people can fit inside that building. And then that's the actual temple itself. And if you notice how beautiful it is, and these are artist rendering, but look at all the gold on all the white stones. It just makes a beautiful scene, a beautiful sight. So let's continue. These stones, they weren't like our concrete blocks and things that we would build out of today. These are massive. So massive, in fact, that it's still an ongoing debate as to how they actually cut them and move them into place. You see some of these stones were over 37 feet long and 12 feet high and 18 feet wide. And they weighed over 100 tons. For comparison... Here are a couple of things that weigh 100 tons. A Boeing 757 airliner. Pretty big. Space shuttle. A diesel locomotive. All these things weigh about the same as these blocks that these people back in ancient Israel were able to move into place and those stones fit together and were cut so perfectly that you couldn't even place a blade of a knife in between these stones. They were hewn perfectly. And they were worth admiring. And there was so much to take in as these disciples are walking with Jesus and the gold that adorned this very building. And the carvings and the structures and the art and the beauty of the temple was incredible and beautiful. The temple was so fantastic, in fact, that the Jews had begun to idolize this place even swearing by it and making vows upon it. Remember, we studied that in Matthew 23, verses 16 through 23. They were making vows on the temple. It was the center of the Jewish culture, the Jewish world of their days. It was a place that every Jewish person loved, and they identified with it. And it was their source of national pride. And you can see that. But then Jesus, in verse 2, he shakes them up. And Jesus answered and said to him, Do you see these great buildings? Not one stone shall be left upon another that shall not be thrown down. Think about how heavy I just said those stones were, a hundred tons. The disciples, they were admiring this building, the center of Jewish culture, the architecture, the majesty And then Jesus hits them with this heavy prophecy on the temple and its destruction. It will be utterly destroyed. Not one stone shall be stacked upon another. Can you imagine hearing those words? We have somewhat of an idea of this destruction in our day. We've all heard the story of the Titanic, the unsinkable ship on its maiden voyage struck an iceberg and sank to the bottom of the sea. Many of us know the space shuttle Challenger, you know, an incredible flying invention that was meant to go into space and safely return, but it exploded shortly after takeoff and disintegrated. Right before our eyes, we were watching it on TV. The World Trade Center, two towers, beautiful and majestic, crumbled utterly. And we could have not perceived the destruction of these things prior to them actually happening because the experts told us these things were perfect and safe and secure. So what Jesus was telling them was not easy for them to hear or imagine. After all, in the Jewish man's mind, the Messiah was to be coming as a victorious king to set up his kingdom on earth. Yet, We all know, looking back, that this prophecy was fulfilled in 70 A.D. 
by Titus. Some six years after they completed the final work of the restoration of this temple. Hmm. The destruction was so complete that the debate still rages on the actual existence of where the temple, we showed the picture of the temple in the grounds, and that's an artist's rendering. No one, there are many ideas of where that temple actually sat within that temple complex. But because of the utter destruction of the stones being torn down from the temple, no one has an exact idea. Or someone probably does and everybody else is wrong. (laughs) And maybe we'll find that out in our lifetime. The historical accounts say that a drunken soldier accidentally started the fire within the temple with an arrow lit on fire. And all the gold that was on the top of the temple melted down into the cracks between the stones. And that's why they removed the stones, stone by stone, till they were all taken apart. So this prophecy, it leads to some questions. The disciples, they're knocked back for a minute. And they walk, and they go to the Mount of Olives. In verse 3 it says, Now as he sat on the Mount of Olives, which is opposite the temple grounds, so they had a perfect view of the temple from where they sat, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign when all these things will be fulfilled? Now, in Mark's gospel alone, he identifies the four people who asked this question. The other synoptics, they don't identify who it was. They asked Jesus privately, when will these things be? And what will be the sign when all these things will be fulfilled? So to understand the questions that they were asking a little bit better, we must look into the mindset of the Jewish person as far as the Messiah coming in that day. Number one, the Messiah would, the, before the Messiah came, there would be a time of terrible tribulation. Number two, into this chaos, there would come Elijah as a forerunner and herald of the Messiah. Number three, then there would enter the Messiah. Number four, the nations would ally themselves and gather themselves together against the champion of God. The Messiah. Number five, they would result in total destruction of the hostile powers. Number six, they would follow the renovation of Jerusalem. Number seven, the Jews who were all dispersed all over the world would be gathered back to the city of New Jerusalem. And number eight, Palestine would be the center of the world and the rest of the world will be subject to it. Now, these three men, they have witnessed the first three things, haven't they? The forerunner of Elijah has come, John the Baptist. Jesus has already pointed that out to them. And then Jesus himself is the Messiah. But it didn't fit into their understanding what Jesus was telling them, that the temple was going to be destroyed completely. Because as we've just outlined, they were expecting a kingdom to be set up there in Jerusalem. So in their ideas and their thinking, they didn't see this gap that exists between that third thing we talked about as the Messiah coming and the fourth thing that we talked about as all the nations coming against them. So now we see how important the questions are from these Jewish men because it didn't fit their narrative what Jesus was telling them. So they asked these specific questions. When will these things be? Because they didn't understand What will be the sign when all these things will be fulfilled? They didn't understand. In verse 5, And Jesus answering them began to say, Take heed that no one deceives you. Take heed that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name saying, I am he, and will deceive many. But when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be troubled. For such things must happen, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be earthquakes in various places, and there will be famines and troubles. These are the beginning of sorrows. 
So Jesus, he tells them, and as we said, take heed, pay attention to what he's telling us. He's telling us to watch out, to see that we are not deceived or taken off track. How would they possibly be taken off track? Well, these false teachers, these disturbances, these wars, these rumors of wars, earthquakes, famines, and all manner of troubles, these things are going to happen. And when they happen, we must be careful because we'll take our focus off of the Lord and focus on these actual happenings. Mm -hmm. We'll take our eyes off of God and his hand in these things and just focus on the actual thing that is happening. Before Jesus begins to elaborate, he tells them to pay attention to what is going on and what is being said. But he also tells them there will be false teachers claiming to be the Messiah, that they may deceive many and steal away followers from the truth. Take heed, pay attention, search it out. We have to ask ourselves whenever there's an event that is presented to us by the media, by social media and, and different things, like maybe Chinese balloons and you know, things that happen, that we don't get caught up in the narrative, right? That we say grounded in God's word. Because if we're not careful, the narrative will carry us away from the truth of God's word. And we have to always remember that God is the one that's in control regardless of the disasters and trials that we see on this planet. And I think it's closely related to what Aaron was teaching on Wednesday as he taught Psalm 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by rivers of waters that brings forth fruit in its season, whose leaf will not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. You see, for us to be unmovable, for us to be planted, for us to have a firm foundation, we have to study God's word. We have to be in God's word. Because otherwise, when things happen, and they, Jesus just told us they're going to happen, here's what's going to happen. But don't be shaken. The way that we're not shaken is that we're to be into God's word. We're to be studying what God has for us so that we know when we see these things that they are things that must happen. We're involved in them. We are here, but we are also in God's hand. We are also in God's care. Many people will take disastrous types of events and use man's words to create their own narrative for profit, for power, and for deception. That's what Jesus is telling us, that they will become false teachers that will steal away. But he tells us, do not be troubled, for such things must happen. But the end is not yet. There will always be wars. Have you ever noticed that? As long as there are men on this planet, there are always going to be wars. There's always going to be rumors of wars. But Jesus says these things must happen. Matthew tells us, see that you are not troubled for these things must come to pass. Signifying that these events that we just read about are not the ultimate sign of the end. But they are something that we should expect to see. And possibly we might end up being a part of. And then he says these are the beginning of sorrows. Or other translations say birth pains. Now, there are many ladies in here who have had children. Do you know what birth pains are like? They get more intense and closer together as the time approaches for the appearing of that child. And so Jesus is telling us that as the time for him to gets closer, these pains, these troubles, these disasters, they'll get more intense and even closer together. It seems is that Jesus is telling us to be more concerned about being deceived about what's going on than he is the actual events that are going on. Mm -hmm. You get that picture? Mm -hmm. And this happens today. While it's exciting to think about Jesus' second coming and the rapture, 
And there are many people in this auditorium that love Bible prophecy, and I'm grateful for that. But we have to be careful that we are not deceived. You see, there are some names that we might recognize over the past several years. Sun Young Moon, he was considered by the Unification Church as the Messiah and the second coming of Christ. Many of you remember the name Jim Jones, who claimed to be the reincarnation of Jesus, of Buddha, of Vladimir Lenin, and Father Divine, and he led his cult to a mass suicide because the people were deceived. Marshall Applewhite, who claimed to be Jesus, he claimed to be the Son of God, prior to leading his Heaven's Gate cult into a mass suicide so that they could rendezvous with a spaceship that was hiding behind Haley's Comet. Many of you remember that one? Or David Koresh, who's the leader of the Branch Davidian sect in Waco, Texas, and he claimed also to be the Son of God. We must take heed, and the way for us to take heed is through God's Word. Verse 9, Jesus continues, he says, But watch out for yourselves. For they will deliver you up to councils, and you will be beaten in the synagogues, and you will be brought before rulers and kings for my sake, for a testimony to them. And the gospel must first be preached to all nations. But when they arrest you and deliver you up, do not worry beforehand or premeditate what you will speak. But whatever is given to you in that hour, speak that. For it is not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. So Jesus, he starts out this teaching of a picture that will first be global, these global events, wars and rumors of wars, all these different troubles. And then he narrows it down to local troubles, where the events of the previous passage, he says, watch out for yourselves. Because if you are not deceived and you take a stand on the truth, the local authorities may come after you in the last days. They may say that you are professing hate speech or that you are a racist. We see that happening in our day. We shouldn't be surprised when it comes down to the local area. But yet Jesus is not telling them to watch or pay attention to how they might avoid persecution. Mm because we may or may not be able to avoid the trouble that lies ahead. He is telling us how to prepare to face the persecution and how to be a faithful witness during that tribulation, during that trial. Have you considered this? I know we don't spend a lot of time thinking about it, but think about it. The trials that we face every day, It may be so that we can be a faithful witness for others. You think about that? It says, but when they arrest you and deliver you up. Mm. Sounds kind of like it might happen. (laughs) We will be given the opportunity to proclaim the gospel before councils, rulers, and kings. And just like Stephen, just like Peter and John, and Paul and others... We will be given a spirit of peace. And the Holy Spirit will give us the words that we are to proclaim as his faithful witness in the moment of our trial. Verse 10 tells us the gospel must first be preached to all nations. And if you remember in Colossians chapter 1, Paul is saying, If indeed you continue in the faith grounded and steadfast, and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you have heard, which was preached to every creature under heaven, of which I, Paul, became a minister. Paul is saying that the gospel had gone out to the known world where they were living in at the time. That has been preached in all of these areas. John 14, 12 tells us, Most assuredly I say to you, he who believes in me and the works that I do, he will do also in greater works than those he will do because I go to my Father. What Jesus is saying is that 
when he was on this earth, he was professing the truth, the gospel. But when he goes away, when he's resurrected, and the Holy Spirit comes upon those who are believers, the Holy Spirit is in each of us. Jesus on this earth in flesh could only be in one place at one time. But when the Spirit fills each of us, and we are all over and have our own different lives, of our own different worlds, as we go out, we can do greater works. We can reach more people with the gospel because each of us can do that. And if you remember in the book of Revelation, as we had that study a, a couple of years ago, remember the two witnesses that stood before Jerusalem and proclaimed the gospel day and night. And then also the 144,000 virgins, Jewish virgins, who not bow the knee to Baal, they proclaim the truth, the gospel. And then the regenerated believers from every nation in Revelation 7. And then lastly, there was an angel. If everybody missed it before then, there was this angel that flew over the world and proclaimed the gospel to the entire world in Revelation 14. You see, what Jesus said is going to happen, but it's also actively happening now because each of us should be sharing that gospel. We should be proponents of what he has called us to do, to share the gospel, to reach our entire world with the truth. Amen? Amen. So we are to be part of this, and in Mark 16, we'll see in a, a couple of weeks, It says this, and he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel. That's what we just talked about, to every creature. So verse 12, back in our study in verse chapter 13, it says, Now brother will betray brother to death, and a father his child, and children will rise up against parents and cause them to be put to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake, but he who endures to the end shall be saved. Now this continues that progression. It started on the global with the wars and rumors of war. Then it came down to the local where the authorities would arrest us. And now it's down into our families where family member will betray family member because of faith in Jesus Christ. And we see that in some of the Muslim nations where someone becomes a Christian and they are betrayed to death by their own family. This is going to be more widespread. The progression of this hate starts on the outside, but it ends with the family. And many people here, there are people in our congregation that have already faced hate in their own family because they are a believer in Jesus Christ, because they stand up for the word of God. How difficult it must be to love people of your own family Yet those same very people turn against you and actively hate and despise you. Verse 13 says, And you will be hated by all for my name's sake, but he who endures to the end shall be saved. You will be hated in the end in the last days. Nothing any of us really wants to be or to, or to do. We want to be liked by everyone, don't we? But in the end times, Jesus will be the chief dividing part. If we proclaim Jesus, people will automatically not like us. Even those in our own family who we trust, who we love, who we care about. But also notice that last verse. He who endures to the end shall be saved. Now this verse is not saying that we have the power in and of ourselves to endure to the end and become the champion of all and save ourselves. It's not what it's saying at all. Endures is translated in the ancient Greek word, upomino, which literally means to remain under. Mm -hmm. So in order to endure, we are to remain under the gospel truth, the hope of our salvation, the word of God. Amen. You see, we're to hold on to our faith. Many who profess Christ previously will fall away. And we've heard about the separating of the wheat and the tares. 
And as an illustration of sorts, we can all look back just a couple of years, and regardless of how COVID affected your life, we have witnessed the widespread panic of COVID, haven't we? How the media and the politicians, they use it to their own advantage to propagate fear and panic and control. It caused great chaos and division, even in families over this virus that was lethal for many people. Many people died from it. But it also had over a 99% survival rate, which no one talked about, the survival rate. They only wanted to present the death rate. And that survival rate is according to the CDC. They had the information, but they didn't send it out because it didn't fit their narrative. They were more focused on the death toll, the death numbers, because that generated fear and chaos. And I say all this just to say that in the last days, when these events take place, if we are not grounded in the Word of God, we're going to be given a <clears throat> we'll be given fear and panic in our own lives. Amen. Now God tells us that he is in control, that he is the one. Now, granted, we we have to think about things on our own, and we have to do what's right in our own eyes. We have to seek God's will for our own self. But we are not to be given a spirit of fear, a spirit of panic. And many people were forced to take sides. So this type of manipulation and panic will be more intense and more frequent as Jesus' return approaches. So get ready. Take heed, as Jesus says. But we must prepare our hearts and our minds and stay grounded in the truth. As we progress through our generation, we must hold fast and endure in the word as we see these progressions take place. We must have enduring faith. Amen? Amen. Now Jesus, he progresses right into the tribulation. In verse 14, he says, When you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing where it ought not, let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who is in the housetop not go down into the house, nor enter to take anything out of his house. And let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes, but woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days. And pray that your flight or your departure may not be in the winter. For in those days there will be tribulation such as has not been since the beginning of the creation, which God created until this time, nor shall ever be. And unless the Lord had shortened those days, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, whom he chose, he shortened the days. Remember again, this is a Jewish Messiah, a Jewish Jesus, who's talking to these Jewish disciples, explaining from the Jewish perspective or the Jewish line of eschatology that what the return or the second coming of Jesus would look like. Mark doesn't include here any reference to the rapture, but he jumps straight into the tribulation period, into the great tribulation, the last three and a half years. With that in mind, Jesus begins this discussion with the abomination of desolation. Remember that happens at the three and a half year period where the Antichrist goes into the temple and proclaims himself to be God. And Jesus is saying, when that happens, run. He's telling that to Jewish men. Leave Jerusalem. He states that. Because verses, the earlier parts we studied in verses 5 through 13 tell us to prepare for something that's about to happen before the tribulation ever gets here. And then as he starts chapter verse 14, it seems to be talking to the Jewish people specifically. And those who are left behind. Flee to preserve your flesh. 
Notice, God will allow the Antichrist to be ruler of this world for 1260 days. It tells us in Revelation 11 and also in Revelation 12. But not one day longer. Because the true Christ will return. And he will bring the lawless one to an end. Just by the appearance of his coming. He will win the victory. The Antichrist, he will want to destroy the Jewish nation. As Satan has always wanted to do. It's all the way through scripture. For this reason, he says, Jesus tells these men it is important to save your life. And especially if you do not know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. So if you're the one that has to know the exact date and time when Jesus will come back, all you have to do is hang around until the abomination of desolation, (laughs) and it'll be 1,260 days after that. I would want to be here. And I'll explain later how to avoid that. You see verse 19, it says, For in those days there will be tribulation such as has not been since the beginning of the creation which God created. Until this time, nor shall ever be. And unless the Lord had shortened those days, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, whom he chose, he shortened the days. Jesus describes this unparalleled destruction and chaos that the world will face. As we read through Revelation, we learn that there are men who are going to understand that this is God's wrath being poured out upon them. Yet they will not repent. They will seek to die, but they will be unable. They will call on the mountains to fall upon them, yet they will not. In all of this destruction and chaos, more than any generation has ever seen or ever will see, God reminds us that He is in control. Verse 20 says, in order to save the elect, God put a limit on this time, this three and a half years, so that if he did not, all flesh would be destroyed. He shows us that he is still, even in chaos, even in disaster, no matter what it is, he is in control. Verse 21 says, then... If anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or look, here he is there, do not believe it, for false Christs and false prophets will rise and show signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. But take heed, see, I have told you all things beforehand. Jesus gives us clear sight into this tribulation time period where false prophets and false messiahs will be of an increasing number but he tells us ahead of time he warns us how it's going to go down so that those who are left behind that are living in this time period can see and understand when they say there's Jesus here's Jesus there's Jesus they'll know that they are trying they're being deceived he said deception will be so great that if it's possible even the elect would be deceived Now, we all know if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, that deception is not possible. If your hope and faith is in Jesus Christ, and there will be people in the tribulation period that come to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, these people that come to know Jesus in this time shall not be deceived. And he reminds us, that he has, given, he has given them and us the answers before we get there. I've told you all things beforehand. And then he continues in verse 24, but in those days, after the tribulation, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give us light and the stars of heaven will fall and the powers of heaven will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and authority. And then he will send his angels and gather together his elect from the four winds, from the farthest part of the earth to the farthest part of heaven. 
That's all of us. We'll be joined together with him. It's a cataclysmic, cosmic sight that all will see in the heavens. The earth and the heavens will be shaken by the power of Jesus Christ and his return. And I believe it will be visible for everyone on the earth. Amen. Jesus is saying, then I will return. And the saved of earth will be gathered to him by his angels. And the saved of heaven will be gathered to him by his angels. And we will take part in his victory. I remember that song, Oh, Victory in Jesus, My Savior Forever. Isn't that great? We will take part in the victory that we look forward to that is yet to come. And I'm amazed that he loves us so much to include us in that. Verse 28 says, Now learn this parable from the fig tree. When this branch has already become tender and puts forth its leaves, you know that summer is near. So you also, when you see things things happening, know that it is near at the doors. Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away. But my words will by no means pass away. Now we've heard this taught many different ways. If we've been a Christian any time at all, and we've heard people teach the Bible. And one theory says that Israel free birth in 1948 was an example of this fig tree. And that one generation, that is one literal generation from 1948, is when Jesus will return. Then you have to factor in how long is the generation? How many years is that? And then... You can imply a date. I have to say that I don't kind of hold to that teaching. I don't think that's what Jesus was trying to teach us about this fig tree. Another is that the word generation is the Greek word genia, which means race, as well as generation. And it could simply mean that God has made a covenant with his people, his Jewish people, that they are not going to be obliterated. And their rebirth as a nation in 1948, in fact, it underscores that God cares about his people and that his promises are right and true and that his prophecy is accurate. (coughs) And their presence in the tribulation will also verify that. In a parallel passage in Luke chapter 21, it says... Then he, Jesus, spoke to them in a peril, looked at the fig tree and all the trees. You see, Luke's passage doesn't isolate the fig tree, but he puts, gives us this visible passing of seasons. Mm-hmm. That as these things begin to change in nature, that's how visible these things he has just talked about in the previous verses of this chapter we'll be able to see those things. And as we see those things, we will know that we are headed to the next season and it is right in front of us. Mm -hmm. It is not a parable in and of itself, in my opinion, of the explanation of an exact date of when Jesus is going to come back for the rapture or when the tribulation is going to begin. Like I said, if you want an exact date, you have to hang around until the midpoint of the tribulation. Let's don't do that. So if, if you kind of reiterated this, the things that he's telling us about that are going to happen, he told us not to be shaken or easily moved, that not to be deceived, that we should understand and see when this big tree begins to bud, it's showing us a change of seasons. Because just as reliable as a tree budding in the springtime that begins to produce fruit or flowers or whatever that tree is called to do, as we see the events happen, we are literally at the door of Jesus' return. Again, these debates are not going to determine or negate anybody's salvation. If you disagree with me, fine, you can be wrong. (laughs) 
No, I'm just kidding. But do know that as we studied earlier in the chapter, that the beginning of these birth pains are seemingly apparent. And just like the fig tree changing in nature, we can see that. And they will be more apparent and more visible as the day approaches. So Jesus tells us to take heed and to watch for these signs so that we know that we know that he is in control. But also remember, he tells us, do not be troubled for such things must happen. But the end is not yet. These are things that are going to happen. And then he also says, see you also. When you see these things happening, know the end is near at the door. To me, this perspective makes sense. Especially when we read the next few verses. Verse 32, it says, But of that day and hour, no one knows. So he's not going to give us a parable that tells us the exact date, and then the very next verse say, Nobody knows. (laughs) Not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Take heed, watch, and pray, for you do not know when the time is. It is like a man going into a far country who left his house and gave authority to his servants and to each his work and commanded the doorkeeper to watch. Watch, therefore, for you do not know when the master of the house is coming, in the evening, at midnight, at the crowing of the rooster, or in the morning. Lest coming suddenly he will find you sleeping. And what I say to you, I say to all, watch. So Jesus wants us as believers to have our hope and our faith in him and in his word and the power of his Holy Spirit that dwells within us. He doesn't want us to be easily shaken or moved by the events of the world. And we have a news media and a social media and all manners of politicians who want the exact opposite. They want to drive us into a place of fear, panic, and control. Let God work in us through these things. Why? So that we can be a testimony when that day comes upon us that we will profess and proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ so that others may hear and so that the whole world will hear the truth of the word of God. Amen. 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 So we are to watch a very strong warning Jesus has given us to take heed as he has said that many times. David Guzik states this about the passage we just read. Some people have the idea that we don't know when Jesus is coming. So it doesn't really matter. We don't know the exact date. It doesn't really matter. And then others have this idea We don't know when Jesus is coming, so we have to find out and set a date. But the right response, according to him, is, I don't know when Jesus is coming, so I have to be alert, eager, and ready for his coming. And I agree with that. We've covered quite a bit today regarding the signs of the times, the signs even of our times that we see in our day. But I want to point out, again, Jesus' focus is for us not to be deceived. For him to come back to find us ready, watching and waiting for his return. We are to be busy about his business. We are to be living life that he's called us to. But maybe, maybe, just maybe, there's someone here that doesn't know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. It's not a complicated thing, as complicated as we Christians like to make it sound like sometimes. All we have to do is admit that we are sinners. The scripture tells us we are all sinners. There is none righteous, no, not one. But it also tells us that while we were yet sinners, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He loved us so much that he died on the cross for each of us. I don't understand that completely. Why would he die for me? Before I loved him. But he loved each of us that much. And then we have to accept what he had done for us on the cross. He paid that debt of sin that we had. You see, we can't pay it. We can't buy it. We can't earn it. We can't do enough good stuff to get into heaven. It's only because of what he did on the cross. He died on the cross 
to save us. If he didn't remain dead, he rose again the third day to give us victory over death and to give us eternal life. And not only that, he sends us his Holy Spirit to live within us, to guide us and to teach us and to correct us and rebuke us when we need it. And we need it sometimes, quite often. Amen. All we have to do is say a simple prayer that goes something like this. Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. And I know that you died on the cross to pay my sin debt. And I accept that. Lord, and I thank you that you died and you rose again on the third day, giving me the victory that I don't deserve. Please come and live within my heart. Be my Lord and Savior. Amen. In Jesus' name, it's just a simple prayer. If you need to pray that prayer, if you're thinking about even remotely praying that prayer, and it's been on your mind, Pastor Aaron's right here, Pastor Kirk, myself, please come see us. We will show you how to know Jesus in a personal way. And then the next step is discipleship. You see, it doesn't just end that, okay, I've got my ticket punched, I'm going to heaven. We need to know what God's Word says. Because you may not have noticed we live in difficult times. And there are things going on in our world that are hard to understand and hard to walk through. But just like Jesus said, he wants us to be ready. He wants us to be prepared. And if we don't know his word, if we don't know him, we don't seek after him, we'll be subject to that panic and fear that we just talked about. And lastly, we are to continually reproduce because the gospel is supposed to go out into the whole world. It is our responsibility to reach out into all the world with the truth of God's word. Amen? Amen. Well, let's pray. Father, we thank you for this word today. God, thank you for the encouragement that you have for us to watch, to be ready, to be prepared. God, you don't just give us the words, God. You give us your word, the Bible, that shows us how to know you, how to be confident and have hope in what you're doing in our lives and where we're at in our lives, even when where we're at doesn't make any sense and it's hard to go through, it's difficult, even depressing and fearful. God, but you have a hope and a joy that you give us that doesn't come from our own self, but only comes from you. We thank you for the confidence, the hope that you give us. And we thank you for the Holy Spirit that lives within us. Lord, that guides us and directs us in all truth. God, we thank you for brothers and sisters in Christ that surround us, that can encourage each of us and lift each other up and pray for each other. And God, I pray for that one who, who may be on the edge of knowing you, who's almost persuaded God, to know you as their Lord and Savior, I pray that today would be the day of their salvation. Lord, I just thank you and I praise you again for all that you do and all that you've yet to do. We give you glory and honor, Lord, because you are the one who is going to be victorious. Thank you, Lord, that you love us. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 If you guys stand, let's uh, praise the Lord one more time. Come all you weary, come all you thirsty, come to the well that never runs dry. Drink of the water.
nations come lay them down at the foot of the cross. Jesus is waiting. God so loved the world. Dear Father, we just thank you so much for just preparing a table for us. And it's really up to us to come to the table. You set the table. You invite us. But we have to take those steps to come to your table, Lord, and pray that we do that today and every day. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You guys have a blessed week.